Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Minterburn Presbyterian Church, Sunday morning service for Caledon and Minterburn Presbyterian Church. And our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah 65. See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Uh, we're going to be thinking a bit about the new heavens and the new earth in, in a few minutes. So it's really just encouraging to see these references to it in the Old Testament. But for now we're going to sing in praise and we're going to sing Jesus is Lord creation's voice proclaims <laughs> of this 
that amazing world that lies ahead of us. We never think how beautiful this world is going to be. You want us to have hope and expectation as we look beyond this life and into the next. So Lord, forgive us when we just don't bother and all the joys of heaven just seem like another thing. Lord, forgive us and help us, even this morning, to see heaven as the thing towards which every other good thing ever has pointed. <laughs> a bit like rocks, though, compared to a great mountain. Lord, help us to catch glimpses this morning. And Lord, while we are here, we very much realise that we do still need your help, that we have, have lots of needs and lots of burdens, and Lord, we bring those to you now. Lord, we continue to pray for those who grieve, <coughs> For the many whom we know who, who grieve in our in our community around us, Lord. And we think of those who are, are grieving for recent loss and those who are, are still grieving for loss that could be a long time ago. Lord, we bring all those needs to you. And Lord, we pray for those who are ill. We pray for those who are in pain. We pray for those who are undergoing treatment. We pray for those who are fearful. We pray for those who are burdened. <coughs> we pray for those that life can just seem to be stretching out a bit and there's not a lot of joy in it. Lord, we bring all these needs to you and we ask for your help and your kindness and your goodness. <coughs> and Lord, we, we are aware of so much pain in the world around us. And just even to mention one thing, the train crash in India, Lord, where so many died. So many more were injured, and Lord, probably pretty badly injured. Lord, please be present in, in all of that, bringing your help and your grace <coughs> and your love and your comfort. And Lord, on a very practical level, uh, this does seem to be a bit of an issue, this train safety thing. So Lord, we, we do pray for, for new safety um, plans to be put in place, Lord, so this sort of thing will, will not happen. And Lord, we pray that for the folks of India, we pray that for ourselves, just for, for general safety and wisdom and, and how we manage the world which we move in. And Lord, we think of those who are struggling with the cost of living, Lord, and just practical concerns and money worries and fears, Lord, the sort of struggles that can face all families at any time. Lord, please reassure us with your love and your care and your provision for us in everything. Please help us to always remember your resources are limitless. Um, and Lord, at the same time, please do give practical help where it is needed and help us to be able to help one another as well. And Lord, finally, we pray for our committee elections, which are, we're nearly over the finish line, we're nearly done. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, guiding throughout the process. Uh, and Lord, we, um, we just pray that you will, will continue to be present, Lord, as the votes are counted. And then, Lord, as the new committee meets together, Lord, for their first meeting in a couple of weeks' time. It's all very exciting, but Lord, we'll just be very powerfully present in all of that. We bring our prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to, as I said, we're going to be looking at the new heavens and the new earth, so I'm just going to read. I have to cut back the level of reading I was wanting to do, so I'm just going to read a few familiar verses from. From Revelation chapter 21, I think I read uh, some of these verses a couple of weeks ago, but uh, and they are quite familiar, but they are great verses. So Revelation chapter 21, right at the end of your Bibles, page 1, 2, 4, 9, if that's any help. So basically you have Revelation 21, and then you're getting into the weights and the measurements. Once you cover the page, it's very once if you're doing your reading the Bible in a year, and you get there, you're like, oh, I've done really well. That's great. So, Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. John is writing. And he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. 
for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And there we will end the reading of God's word. And so we're going to sing again. We are going to sing, um, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I was very excited. I was reading um, a bit of Psalm 19, and it, was, uh, it says, May these words of my mouth, this meditation of my heart, be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's what we're going to sing again Sunday. So let's sing together. <laughs>
gorgeous, gorgeous words, so we will definitely return to that. I am now going to ask the children up to the front. Okay, 
caveats. Now, I did have a phone. Nobody has a phone handy, though. Is my phone to use the phone? Well, there's something very handy on your phone. There's a torch on your phone. And what does a torch help you to do? Follow me. See. It helps you to see. Charlie, where does it help you to see? Um, if there's rats in the shed, the <laughs>
especially since school seems to be such a, a burden. I'm going to mention the Narnia books later. Has anybody read the Narnia books? Richard has at school, really? Very good. Okay, we're going to get a chant going. You know we like a chant? We have to read the Narnia books. Okay? We have to read the Narnia books. Come on. We have to read the Narnia books. This is not working at all. <laughs> Come and join with me. We have to read the Narnia books. We have to read the Narnia books. Okay, fine, I'll do it. In the Narnia books, what they describe heaven as, they say it's a bit like coming to the end of the school. You know when you die and go to heaven, it's like coming to the end of the school term and going on holiday. And you've got the whole long holiday stretching out ahead of you, and the weather's going to be perfect, and you're not going to get burnt, and there's not going to be any bugs, and nobody's going to fall out. It is just going to be the best holiday ever. And that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That's why you always need to read the Narnia books. Right, I am now going to pray for you. Is that okay? So let's all pray together. Perfect. Uh, dear God, thank you for the hope of heaven. Thank you even for this image of the turn coming to an end and the holidays coming, Lord. It's a really horrible image. Help us to, to get a sense of just how amazing it's going to be with you. In a place where no bad things happen and we're never hurt and we're happy all the time. Lord, just excite us all and help us to catch a glimpse of uh, just the beauty that is heaven and the hope that is heaven. Lord, bless the children. Be with them. Watch over them over this next week, Lord, and as they head into the summer holidays, keep them safe and help them to enjoy school a little bit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you're all brilliant. We are going to sing Jesus' Love is Very Wonderful. You can stay up here. There may be a reaction to Jesus' Love is Very Wonderful. Oh, there are. There are actions for Jesus' Love is Very Wonderful. That's very exciting. I
Um, the, the Bible is very visual in the way it describes heaven and you're, I always use this word glimpse, you're only getting glimpses of something. John is trying to describe something to us that he doesn't really even have the words to describe, but he's still trying very hard to paint this picture of what it's going to be like. So I'm not going to be turning around every now and again and going, so you know, tomorrow morning this will affect you in this way. I guess the big application I would make is that if you're a Christian who believes in Jesus, this is your hope. This is your hope. This is the hope of heaven. And this is amazing. And this carries us through things. I think sometimes for other, other things we're not able to. Uh, Johnny Erickson, I was reading her, she's written a book about heaven, unsurprisingly. She's paralyzed from the neck down. And she says she thinks about heaven a lot. Heaven is really important to her, really significant to her. Um, so that is our hope. This is our hope for those of us who are Christians. For those of us who are not Christians at this point, there is, there's, the invitation is open. Please come to Jesus, ask for forgiveness. He will forgive you your sins. He will accept you and look after you and bring you to be with him in heaven when you die. But there are very clearly two paths. So that's, I guess, a big application before we even start. One of the paths leads to heaven, and one of the paths leads to hell, as I talked about last week. But today I'm, I'm painting a picture, so it's a bit of an imaginative thing as well. So hopefully we'll all catch glimpses of what God wants us to catch glimpses of. So we talked a few weeks back about what happens when Christians die. And we talked about how for Christians they go to heaven, or paradise as the Bible calls it. So you close your eyes in this life and you open them in the next and heaven will be wonderful and joyful and exciting and in God's presence. All the fear and the pain and the sadness and the discontent will be gone. We, all, we will know that we are finally where we always long to be, with God. We might not realise how deep that longing to be with God is within us, how deep that need is. It's not, it's not a great example, but it's a bit like you're working hard. And then you get a couple of days break. Only a couple of days, of course. And uh, you go to Port Rush. And it's weather like it is at the moment. And where you're staying is perfect. And everything you want is there. And the pollen count, for some reason, is really low. And, and you have this massive, comfortable bed that is just wow. perfect. And you lie down on the bed and you think, I didn't realise this. But this is exactly where I need to be. This is perfect for a second or two or three. All your cares and your tiredness and your worries, they just all melt away. And it's just... <sighs> now on earth, this probably does only last a couple of minutes for us. Because very soon, different worries and concerns start popping into our head. But in heaven... That feeling of, this is where I'm meant to be, and this is perfect. It will be multiplied to the max. I have come home. This is where I've always been looking for. And the feeling will continue. You're like your very best holiday on your very best day, but forever. So heaven is going to be delightful. That is the place we go to when we die. But we also talked about how all of us on earth and heaven are still waiting for the main event. And the main event is the resurrection. Jesus will return. And those of us who are alive, we will go up to meet him in the sky is the description that we get. And meanwhile, all the dead in Christ over all the millennia, they will be raised. And after the resurrection, we will be living in what the Bible calls the new heavens and the new earth. And we get a lot more detail about the new heavens and the new earth. About the place that we go to after the resurrection. We're told a lot more about it. About how it will be beautiful and awe-inspiring and dazzling and dripping with jewels and gold and precious stones. And there will be golden streets that will be translucent and it will just be... And as you're reading all this stuff, and especially if you read it out loud, you just begin to grasp that John is seeing amazing things. You know, it's the, it's the bit emoji with the head exploding. He's seeing amazing things, and he really can't find the words to adequately describe.
describe it because there's very little for him to compare it to. The magnificence and the beauty will be something he has never encountered before. But he tries to describe it. So in Revelation 21 and 22 uh, in particular, he goes over a lot of territory, but the main event is this great city descending from heaven to earth. And this great city is us. It is the church. It is the ones who love Jesus, glorious and perfect and beautiful. And this great city is huge. It is absolutely massive. One Bible footnote. Um, and I'm not going to go to heaven with a measuring tape and, and check out if this is right. Because John is just trying to give us a sense of something. But one Bible footnote said the measurement given for the city was 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. That is a monstrosity of a city. And its walls are 65 metres thick. That's really big. We, we were discussing this, and I meant to check, we were discussing this coming back from college, and I meant to check. John may well have been alive after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. He may well have witnessed those things or been aware of those things. And so for him, these would have been really powerful descriptions because Jerusalem was black, was destroyed, everybody was killed. One bit of the temple wall was left and that was it. But for John, this is the new Jerusalem and it is perfect and it is majestic and it is massive. Because there are going to be so many people in the new heavens and the new earth. There will be so many of us all across history, all across the world, all the different nations. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing, actually. Billions of people whom God has brought home to be with himself. But I, mean, you'll, I think you'll be able to, you, you won't have to stay in the city necessarily. It will not be crowded. There will always be space as is needed because the new heavens and the new earth are overflowing with provision for us. But I'm just really excited about the thought of how many there will be of us. It's a really encouraging thought. We're, we're small churches in a small country in a continent that doesn't really care for God anymore, but we are part of this incredible movement of people who love Jesus. And the descriptions then, they continue to be amazing. Everything is about the number 12 and multiplications, which I've discovered I can't say, of the number 12. So the city is a perfect square. Uh, the names of the 12 uh, children of Israel are written on the, the walls, I think on the pillars. The names of the 12 apostles are written. And the foundations of the city, this is how amazing it is, the foundations are decorated with precious stones. And the same stones that have been in the breastplate of the priest in the Old Testament. God has brought it all together. All of it. All the promises. The Old Testament and the New Testament, the beauty and hope of the tabernacle, of the temple, of Jesus himself. And the amazing thing is that in the same way that Jesus came to live among us, now God in this amazing city is coming down with us to live among us. And there will be no more temple. There will be no more local churches, no need, because the city itself will be the temple. It's almost as if the Holy of Holies, which was bigger than that, but it wouldn't have been that big, the Holy of Holies in the temple has been taken and just blown up to be this massive, massive dwelling place where God and all his people will be. And we read it earlier, God's dwelling place is among his people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. No need for a temple. God is right here with us. As Psalm 46 says, God is in the midst of her and she will not be moved. And in the same way that Jesus brought heaven and earth together when he lived on earth, the holy city, which is us, which is our city, will descend from heaven to earth. Heaven and earth will come together and not be separated anymore. This is how it was always meant to be. Perfect unit, joined together until it was destroyed and ruined in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> so that means, for example, and I think this is quite a hard one, I'm trying to talk about a tiny bit to the children there. There's, 
not going to be any summer moon. It's quite hard to get the old head around. The salmon love the sun and the moon. The Bible writers love the sun and the moon. But it turns out that the sun with all its power and its radiance and the moon with all its kind of mystery and beauty, turns out they were only ever pointing to the real light, to the real warmth, to the real beauty. They were only pointing to the real heart delighting joy of the morning day and it's all to be found in God himself. He will be the sun and there will be no night there. All of these things have always pointed to God. And the nations will come to the city and they will walk those golden streets. And we assume they'd be able to go in and out because the gates will always be open. Gates in a city back in the day would always have been closed at night. But there is no night. There is no danger. There is no sin. There are no enemies. There is no need. There is complete safety and freedom and peace to walk about as and when and where you like. It is, quite literally, to use the phrase, it's all good. All of it. And then we move into chapter 22. We've already established there will be no sea. And what the writers mean when they say that is there's no chaos or monsters or mysterious things that could attack us or cause any danger in any way. So there's no sea, but there is a river. The most beautiful river flowing through the most beautiful city. And on both sides of river is the tree of life. Now we met the tree of life right at the beginning of the Bible story of the Garden of Eden. It was the reason Adam and Eve were shut out of the garden um, so that they, they had sinned and God did not want them to eat from the tree and to live forever. So here we are right back again at the tree of life. And it is bearing fruit for us to eat. It is bearing fruit for all of us, for all the nations, for our healing and our well-being and our joy. People, the curse has gone. It has been overturned. It has been defeated. And in its place is just blessing upon blessing upon blessing. The battle has been fought and it has been won by Jesus. When he came to live among us, not only did he defeat illness and poverty and death and sin and hell, he was victorious when he died on the cross and rose again. And by trusting in him, we share in that victory. And we go after we die to be with him in that place of victory. The kind of books I read growing up, there was often a battle scene where everybody gets hurt and bloody and dirty and exhausted. And even when the battle is over, there is still the lengthy trudge home. And then there would always be a scene where everyone would be welcomed into a place of safety. And they would have the most amazing bath. I do feel I'm talking a lot about beds and baths. It's like an advertisement for that American shop, bed, bath and beyond. But they would have the most amazing bath. And they'd be given the most amazing clothes. And their wounds would all be treated. And they would rest in the most comfortable bed. And the windows would all be open. And there would be the most gentle breeze. There would be no flies, but the most gentle breeze. And you would hear birds, and the smell of flowers would come in, and they would know it's over. It's okay. I'm safe. I'm here. It's all good. Currently, as Christians, we are still trudging home after the battle. And there can be skirmishes, and we might meet bandits, but we will one day go home, and it will all be perfect, and we will be safe. Now, a couple of questions, maybe to get a wee bit more precise. Will we have bodies? Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yes. I love a bit of participation. Yes, we will have bodies, in the same way that Jesus had a body. When he was resurrected, we will have bodies. When Jesus came back, he was, I know there was a couple of situations where people were stopped, if you like, from recognising him. 
But the disciples did recognize him. It was reasonably straightforward for them. He was, he was recognizable, but he was different. But he was also the same. But there was something slightly different. But he was very recognizable. We will be recognizable and we will recognize others. We will recognize our friends and our families. But they will not be the priority. The priority is going to be Jesus. And I'm not telling you that so that when you get there, you have a bizarre flashback. My goodness, this will not be good. But you have a bizarre flashback to Joanna Church going, yeah, the priority is Jesus. You have, to, the priority, you have to go and see Jesus. And you sort of think, right, well, I need to go and greet the host almost. And then I'll go and talk to my auntie because I really want to talk to her. No, you're going to get there. And everything is going to go out of your head apart from this is Jesus. All the love and joy and hope you have ever experienced on this earth was always about Jesus. And you will find all of it answered in Jesus. And you will long to be with him. And you will long to gaze on him. And you will long to worship him, every part of you. And when we see people we love, we will be delighted and it will be wonderful. But Jesus will be the center of our world. We'll, we will have memories. We will have memories. We will have memories. We will not start off as blank sheets. I will be Joanne with all the good stuff, whatever that is, and none of the bad stuff. And I'm really looking forward to that because the bad stuff is a real struggle. I can't imagine what I'll be like without it, but it will be great. And that's the same for all of us. We will be recognizably who we are, the essence of us, the Joanne-ness or the Sadie-ness or the Margaret-ness. <laughs> I just I start picking people. It will all be there. <coughs> but the memories that we have will have all the pain washed away from them. Uh, as the psalm I read earlier said, that will not come to mind anymore. And if there, I suspect if there was ever anything that was forming in our lives that was painful, if it even crosses, it'll just be like a, a dream we had when we were a child. It'll be so far away and it'll have no impact on us at all. So we will still be ourselves, but our memories will be washed free of the pain. Will we eat? Yes, the resurrected Jesus ate. And the Bible and Revelation are full of feasts and meals and banquets and reunions and, and rejoicing. Of course, the food will be great and we'll always have enough and we'll always eat the right stuff. And there'll be a really good mix. But we'll never eat too much because in every area of our lives we'll be, we will be completely satisfied. So the food will just always be just right. It will be a joyful thing, never a stressful thing. For a lot of us, food will be quite stressful. None of that then. And then the really big one for everybody. I think I'm coming near an end of this one. Yes, I am. Will there be work? Well, yes. It will be earth. And there will be work. We're not going to a completely alien world of sort of strange pink bubbles or anything. It's earth. With trees and rivers and land, we will we will be eating. So there will be farming. Uh, though I'm a bit concerned in a world where the lions won't lie down with the lambs, I I sense a vegetarian vibe. I'm just going to throw that out there to prepare you. I don't know, but I just well. but there will be farming. There will be food. We will probably need to build, but there will always be resources. There will always be space. We are going to be kings and queens. We are royal children. We will always have plans and projects and different ways in which we're serving our Father. But those plans and perfect, uh, projects we will manage perfectly. And no one will ever be greedy or selfish or anxious. It will be like work, but on your very, very best work day, doing the work you most, most enjoy. We will be satisfied and joyful with the work that we have to do. And you know all the hitches that you run into, there won't be any hitch. And there might be other things you want to do. People might want to paint. They might want to learn to paint. There might be people who want to read, who want to explore, who want to talk, who want to teach, who want to learn, who want to listen. In the Narnia books, there's always this cry, farther up and farther in. 
There's always farther up and farther in, in the new heavens and the new earth, because the new heavens and the new earth are the dwelling of God, who has infinite resources and infinite love for us. And there will be time to do all of these things. Uh, when you read people about talking about heaven, um, and that's from Johnny Ericks and uh, Sinclair Ferguson to all sorts of people, when you read people talking about heaven, they always end up at some point mentioning C.S. Lewis. It's just it's very hard. As, as a child, he definitely formed a lot of my imagination, and I think for a lot of these people, their imaginations have been formed by C.S. Lewis, and, and you could not do better than have your imagination formed by, by C.S. Lewis, who just has biblical theme after biblical theme after biblical theme so subtly included in the stories that it's only 20 years later you go, oh my goodness, that was in Narnia, I didn't realise. But uh, he, uh, he finishes, I just wanted to finish on this. So this is the seventh book of the Narnia series, The Last Battle, and they're all in heaven, let's just put it like that, everybody's in heaven. And it says, but for all of them it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world, and all their adventures in Narnia, had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and in which each chapter better than the one before. That is the hope that lies ahead of us. This is only the title page. It's only the title page. It'll be a very brief forward. And every chapter is going to be better than the one before because we serve a great God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father inspire us with the joy and the thrill of heaven and our hope that lies with you, Lord. Thrill us, Lord, with the joy that is going to be spending all of eternity with you, worshipping you, and seeking to serve you in a place of just perfection and beauty and joy. A place, Lord, where every chapter is going to be better than the one before. So, Lord, bless us and encourage us with these thoughts. In Jesus' name, Amen. And in closing, we are going to sing together all my days.
that you reign over all. And we pray, Lord, that just our gifts and offerings will be used to honour you, to spread those cries and work in your word, even here in this life. And as we go into the week ahead, may we be people who rejoice in the hope of heaven with you and the joy and the glory that lies ahead of all of us who believe. And may that impact every area of our life this week and for all of our weeks. Bless us now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.